Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of the Tool Belt Podcast brought to you by Plant Services. Uh, today, we have a special guest with us, David Fry, uh, an industry guru, uh, recently retired from Kimberly Clark, and someone I met recently at the RPM conference in Kalamazoo, Michigan. David, thanks for being on today's episode. Well, thanks for having me. This is a good, good opportunity. Well, for those of uh, our audience who, who haven't met you yet, uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're working on right now? Sure. Well, I'm, uh, I have 45 years experience uh, with uh, reliability, starting with the U.S. Navy weapons systems and going through uh, 21 and a half years at Kodak and then uh, being corporate director at Kaiser Aluminum for uh, reliability and maintenance excellence. And then uh, 10 years with Kimberly Clark. Uh, helping to lead globally, uh, Kimberly Clark. And I also have my own consulting company. I've had that since 2008. I help other people with reliability. Excellent. Well, what are some of the favorite projects that you worked on at uh, either from the Navy or from Kimberly Clark? Uh, Kimberly Clark's the most recent one. And number one is the global reliability, the concept of global reliability with Kimberly Clark being kind of a five major corporations under one uh, under one roof. Uh, bring that all together and having a, a reliability model uh, was was really big for me. And um, then uh, having the the latitude to create an integrated deployment model that that took what was maintenance in one camp and engineering in a different camp and operations in a different camp and bring them together uh, under one integrated deployment model. And then having the, the uh, opportunity to actually deploy that model. So it sounded good on paper, made sense to me, but how does it work when you put it in motion? And so I had the chance being a deployment leader in the Latin America region to actually play this model out and very, very happy with that. Uh, and a few other things that, that made a mark, that made a difference was, one is I created a lubrication network at Kimberly Clark. At that time, we had 113 plants globally. and Trying to get your head around lubrication is uh, is quite the challenge, and we have a start with North America, and have rep from each plant in North America, and uh, got them connected with the the top vendors that are out there, the ones that I carefully vetted, and I also created a condition monitoring uh, predictive maintenance network um, to bring some of the new technologies into uh, Kimberly Clark. And one of the ones that I'm the most proud of is bringing ultrasound in uh, as a technology to Kimberly Clark. Uh, and I also started a, a, a CRL network, a certified reliability leader network. So I, it didn't appear that we had, we've got really smart people at Kimberly Clark, there's no doubt about that, but do they know how to lead? Do they know how these systems all work? So I was the first uh, CRL certified reliability leader at Kimberly Clark. And when I left, there were 97 CRLs. So I'm pretty proud of that. That was that was big. Wow, that is amazing. And that's, uh, you know, we've noticed that it's oftentimes leaders and plants aren't don't get that kind of formal training, that guidance to take the next step. Even they may get promoted and it may be years before they get any kind of formal leadership assistance or support like you're talking about. That's fantastic. Well, I was a CMRP and have been for a long. Actually, I was a CM certified maintenance reliability professional from the SMRP the first year it came out. Uh, and took that test, passed it, and said, that's what it means. I'll never take that one again. <laughs> so I let my certification lapse, uh, and then I picked it back up when I when I started my consulting company. I said, you know, I need certifications to show somebody, and I, I recertified as a, as a, uh, as a CMRP. Um, but the CRL, I, I did it just to do my due diligence. I wanted to bring something into Kimberly Clark, mm -hmm. and so I just went to take a look at this five-day workshop and see what it was all about. And the uptime elements that are in there give you a framework. So it's all of the pieces you need are nice and neat and neat little categories and descriptors of each one and kind of how it all fits together. Doesn't tell you how, but it tells you the what of all the pieces that you need. And there's quite a bit of examples in there on how to lead something like this. So it, mm -hmm. it was worth it. Uh, and then after leaving here, I actually retired, theoretically retired in April of this year. Uh -huh. Um, but I've been working recently with a, uh, a startup uh, reliability called UpT Reliability Solutions. Uh, that's out of Western Michigan, and that's been a lot of fun uh, getting them started and started on the right track, the right foot. I'm really happy with how that's going. That's good. Yeah, UpT was uh, uh, there was a big UpT uh, force out there at the RP at the RPM show. I remember seeing them. Yep. So, 
Well, it, it strikes me too, David, that a lot of the work you described is some pretty heavy lifting in terms of change management. Uh, the, the people work involved in reliability. You you brought cross-functional teams together. Uh, you, you, you trained people to be uh, leaders. That's I, I, Is there some part of that work that you're specifically drawn to, the, the, the helping people realize what's in themselves? Well, I, I learned a long time ago, it's the people stupid. <laughs> like, you know, they used to say in, in politics, it's the economy stupid. Well, in, in reliability, it's the people stupid. Sure. It's all about the people. The, the, the technology has been wrung out. It's all artificial intelligence now in manufacturing 4.0. That's all, you know, taken over. And everybody, if you've got a checkbook big enough, you can just go buy it. And everybody can buy the same technology, but you can't buy the same culture and people. Sure. And so, so it's about empowering your employees. It's about showing them what, what's in it for me. Why would they want to do this? And what's in it for me? And, and, and I've done a lot of stuff with all levels of the organization, all the way from the, the, the boardroom down to, to entry-level shop floor people. Mm-hmm. And there's something in it for everybody in terms of reliability. Um, it's, it's, the only, it's the only initiative. And, and I've got a strong lean background. When I was with Kodak, I was trained by Shingejutsu um, senseis. In, in lean. I've got a pretty strong lean background too. Wow. And I, and I chose reliability and TPM or reliability. I chose that. Um, it's the only initiative that I'm aware of that will improve safety, quality, delivery, cost, and employee engagement, all five with one initiative. Hmm. You know, as a consultant, I go to plants all the time and, and they've always got a safety department. They've always got a quality department. They're always working on this stuff. They're always sweating on time delivery. And of course, they're always worried about cost. Mm-hmm. And if they have time left over, they worry about the employees. Well, the employees are how you get this stuff. If you engage them from the beginning. Uh, and in one of the slides that I that I showed at, at RPM, and it, it's one that's kind of near and dear to me, and I learned this from the Japanese, actually, is the, is the, the concept of, of individual Kaizen or individual improvement. And, and so the slide was, it, it says, what's worth more, one million dollar improvement or a million one dollar improvements? Hmm. They're both worth a million bucks. What's easier to get? A million one dollar improvements or one million dollar improvement? And right. the, the shop floor is full of one dollar improvements. All you have to do is ask. And, and they're full of those. So, so there was another slide in there. I wish I could you know, show it on this podcast, but but it's what's the most powerful life form uh, in the world. And it's not the elephants and blue whales and things like that. It's the insects. Mm. Think about if the insects are gone, we're all gone. <laughs> so how do you, how do you attack this, this problem? And I'm not calling shop floor in- workers insects because I have the utmost respect for them. I know where my pay- paycheck comes from and right. it comes from them. It, it's, they're already there. They already know how to do this stuff. We just need to be smart enough to listen to them. Right. So it's all about the small improvements. And that's where the culture piece comes in. Well, it, was that at your keynote? Because at RPM, I had to leave a day early. So I only had a chance to listen to your first presentation more on operator-based care. Were these, were these slides in uh, the, the keynote uh, called mm-hmm. Bringing It All Together? Yes, it was. It was all about bringing it all together. And it kind of, you know, you can tell people what, and there's a lot of what stuff out there. I mean, uh, Ron Moore's book, Making Common Sense, Common Practice, great what book, really good stuff. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of, you know, well-written books out there, and they tell you what, but they don't tell you how. Mm. <laughs> and that's where you bring the consultant in. <laughs> and uh, But you don't really need it. You, you need to learn to listen and uh, listen to your people and trust them. And uh, But you, you, have to, you have to set a vision out there. Mm-hmm. You have to be smart enough to be able to tell people, here's where there is, and then then show them the first couple steps. And in some cases you may need to bring in an outsider to take a good look at it. Mm -hmm. Uh, One thing I learned, and I've worked in over 200 factories in in my career, well over 200 factories in my career. And, and sometimes to bring a big change like this in, and I always start out by interviewing and I, and I talk to the people who are going to sign my paycheck, the the, the executives, what do you want out of this Mm -hmm. um, to make sure that it's practical. And, um, then I talk a little bit about the approach that, that I've crafted for this stuff. And they always say, well, that's really great, but the, the union will never agree to that or the shop floor will never agree to that. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, well, then can I go talk to the shop floor and union leadership stuff? So I go off in a corner and talk to them. I don't bring them to me. I go to the floor and talk to them mm-hmm. and say, what do you want to get out of this? And 
you know, well, we just want a better place to retire to dealing with these same problems over and over again. And well, how about if we could get you, you know, involved and engaged and, and listen to what you're saying? Oh, that'd be great, but management will never let us do that. <laughs> so they both say exactly the same thing and they both want exactly the same thing. Sometimes middle leadership's a little different, but but uh, the, the top and bottom, they want exactly the same thing. They all want to be profitable. They all want a safe place to work. You know, they all want, uh, uh, you know, continuity with their jobs and they want to make as much money as they can. They all do top and bottom. Mm -hmm. um, and they all want the same thing. And, and, and I've gotten to where I won't work on just technical things. If I can't work with the culture, I'm not interested in the job. I won't consult with you. I won't help you. Mm -hmm. I know how to do these things, but I just won't do it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and one thing I thought was interesting, when I left Kimberly Clark and they had the Let's Roast Dave Fry <laughs> Zoom mm -hmm. meeting because we couldn't meet because of COVID, but the vice president of global supply chain uh, said um, when I left, he said one thing different. He goes, most people at Kimberly Clark are known for the projects. They're known for the big machines they bring in or starting up factories and things like that. And he said, you're not known for any of that. He said, your footprints are much deeper because you're known for helping the people see what needs to be done and actually changing the culture and your stuff will last a lot longer than any of these projects. Wow. What a tremendous compliment. Holy cow. So that, that, you know, that just meant a lot to me because you wonder when you're going through this, it's thankless. It's the same mundane job every day. You got to go push the rock. You got to go push the rock mm -hmm. and the rock's really big and it doesn't seem like it'll want to move. But if you continue with it, if you believe in what you're doing and continue, trust me, the rock will move one day. Mm -hmm. And when it starts moving and picks up momentum, you have a bigger problem. How do you get ahead of the rock? Because once it starts rolling downhill, there's a fine line between autonomy and anarchy, and you can't allow this to devolve into, into anarchy. Right, right. Well, and if it, I, it's a tremendous force. When you get the when you get the workforce behind you, it's a tremendous force for change. Yeah. Well, and to, to extend the metaphor, it sounds like things like the uh, uh, uptime elements can provide the guardrails to help direct the rock at that point. You know, you, you, you can, the, the, the what doesn't change, even though the how does, like you said, the how might be different from plant to plant, but the what, keep things moving in the right direction can, can be the same. Well, and if you implement in the right order, if you look at the uptime elements, I mean, it starts out with basically your mission and your vision mm -hmm. um, and your rules of engagement. As a leader, what, what are we going to do? What are we going to allow? What are we not going to allow? We need to formalize those and nobody likes doing that, but mm -hmm. it's necessary just, just, uh, you know, eat, eat your, eat your vegetables. You'll get strong. You'll get big and strong. Just eat your vegetables. You know, nobody <laughs> likes that, but, but, um, uh, that's where it starts out with the elements. And if you have that and do that and use that as a guiding document, mm -hmm. now you got a reference you can always go back to and keep everybody on the same page. Well, let me dive into one of those elements. It was your first presentation at RPM, and it really resonated. It was the one on operator-based care. And sure. you mentioned out loud at the conference, too, that it was a very specific element. Um, it's an element that everyone, I think, has been more aware of during the COVID pandemic because of all the challenges to work through COVID-based sick outs, quarantines, and also still the ongoing retirements. So can you recap for the listeners on the podcast, some of the types of tasks that in your experience you think operators are suited for or the ones that they're drawn to? Sure. Uh, before you start down the path of operator-driven reliabilities, you have to, to convince yourself that you're actually going to listen to the operators and, and, and their, their input has value. <laughs> don't even go down that path. If you're not gonna, if you, don't ask them if you're not going to listen to them. Okay? Right. right. But when you, when you do, then the operators are out there all the time and, you know, and I can go as a, as a technician. I've been everything from a from a shift mechanic to a to an op I was an operator for a little while, to an engineer to a director. No matter what level you're at, um, the closer you are to the machine, the more you know the machine. If you're in there on the machine 12 hours a day, five, six, seven days a week, they have a sense. They know when something is going to break. And I, and I asked the operators, how many of you knew something was going to break before it did? And to a person, they will say, yeah, here it is. So look, listen, and feel. But ask the operators to look, listen, and feel. Does, does this, is this wobbling? Um, does it, is it making a, a clunking sound or a squeaking sound? Or do you feel an unusual vibration? Um, and I, as I said at the conference, I've been married 45, year, 45 years and my wife's never been stranded. Mm. Because we practice autonomous care. She doesn't know what it is but it's a noise or it's a, it's a squeak or it's a feel. And I know the consequence of failure. She remembers things I did wrong 45 years ago. And if she gets stranded, I'm going to hear about that for the next 45 years. So, so it's all about eliminating the consequence of failure. 
And, and so the look, listen, and feel, and in some cases, using simple technology like ultrasound has gotten simple enough now that we actually have very successfully used the operators um, to do that. So they can look, listen, feel, mm -hmm. um, and maybe rounds around their machine or, or routes or whatever you want to call them. Just walk around the machine and see what it looks and sounds like. Um, they can check oil levels uh, very well. They can check gauges. They can check filters uh, that are outside the cabinets. And if they are not outside the cabinets, move them out so the operators can check it. Um, simple wear part replacement, sometimes belts, you know, they're very, very simple replacements. They're spring loaded belts, stuff like that. Simple, low speed lubrication, non-critical lubrication. No, my philosophy is the operators are not genetically different from the maintenance people. They're the same genetic makeup. The only difference is the training. If the operators are already there, like my wife puts her own gas in her car. She mm -hmm. can take you to a mechanic to have gas put in it, but she puts her own gas in her car. She'll fill her own windshield washer fluid. She'll, you know, pay attention to her windshield wipers and tell me when things are going wrong. She washes her own car. She vacuums her own car. Those are all maintenance things. And so what we want to get the operators to treat the machine like it's their own and not a rental car. And I don't care how dirty a rental car is when I turn it in. I really don't. And I make sure there's gas so I don't have to pay $9 a gallon to get it filled up. But that's about all I do with a rental car. Right. That's someone else's asset. You're exactly right. Yeah. But, but my own cars, no, I, I take care of my cars. And so, so we, we want to get that mindset, of just treat it like it's, it's theirs and then provide training. Um, you do want to be very careful with lubrication because I've seen more damage from a grease gun than probably any other tool in the toolbox. But, but uh, things like that, um, just, okay. just look, listen, feel, and, and then listen to them when they say there's something not right. And the standard answer that I've seen going into these things is, They'll, they'll call a maintenance person and say, this thing's making this clunking noise. And then the maintenance person will say, okay, well, call me when it breaks. Well, <laughs> you just lost yeah. your opportunity to, to head off the, the failure. So, so um, it's really more of an organizational change. The operators, most of them are more than happy to do things like this. Okay. That reminds me of a conversation I had in a plane one time flying out to one of the automation fairs. Uh, where two, the two people next to me happened to be operators who were being trained up to do operator-based uh, maintenance tasks. And they were excited about it. They, as you said, I, they were being listened to and they were being trained to pitch in. And they couldn't have been more excited. They saw it as both job security and it would to get more professionalized. So well, when, when I was at Kodak, I created a, a, a deal there. We called it MOA, Maintenance Operator Agreement. Mm -hmm. And and that is specific training to to change specific components, specific tasks. Mm -hmm. But they're the most commonly performed task, and they do require a pretty fair amount of training. Uh, and we were under FDA GMP uh, uh, regulations. We were made class two medical devices. Mm -hmm. um, so so we had to actually have certifications. And, but we had the training for the operators, and and for every I don't know five MOAs, maybe they got a ten cents an hour or something. We get, we rewarded them for it. But what we found was, was they had enough training, enough skills that if maintenance people called in sick or like this COVID deal where you're, you know, you don't have that many maintenance people, the operators can do an awful lot. They're, they're the first, uh, first responders, basically. Um, once they have this, this training, we didn't turn them loose. We didn't say, Hey, go, go do whatever you think you can do. Um, it was very specific tasks that, that they were certified to do. Right. Um, and you and you can take it as far. And when you get into union, I mean, you can run into some issues when you get into union, you know, shops there about the tools they're allowed to use. And you have to take it on a task by task basis. Okay. Well, then let me ask a follow up question to the operator question. When it comes to care like that, what types of tasks have you uh, discovered are best kept in the hands of maintenance reliability professionals? What are some of the things that you simply would never want to delegate out? Uh, most lubrication. That sounds funny because that's where most people start. Give them all a grease gun. Two, two guys in a grease gun, we'll call her good. Um, lubrication is, really, is a science. There's a lot to it. Uh -huh. And and anything high speed, uh, motors, things like that, getting the right grease in the right amount at the right time, you can do a lot of damage. So I, I tend to keep that in specialized. Now, I have very successfully at Kodak, we had, we call them lubricanos. They called themselves the lubricanos. Mm -hmm. And they they came from <laughs> operations but they had Noria training. They had a lot of training in lubrication. So when we were running, they were operators. And when we were shut down doing maintenance, they worked for the maintenance group doing lubrication, but they were highly trained to do that. Um, most electrical work, um, you know, if you, if you uh, OSHA says that 
that if you send an operator into an electrical panel that does not have recognized electrical training, whatever that means, um, and they're injured, the, the maintenance manager or plant engineer is criminally liable. They can go to jail for it. Wow. So wow. I would not really send an untrained operator in to reset an overload because it, it will blow up in their face or can blow up. And I've seen that happen. So most electrical work, um, you know, I, I keep within the skilled trades. Uh, and, and even, you know, when you have the different trades, if you have somebody that's just a mill writer, just a pipe fitter, just something like that, and doesn't have recognized electrical training, I don't send them in electrical cabinets either. <laughs> so, so it's, it's things that require specialty training, uh, you know, boilers, uh, things like that. Um, work requiring rigging and hoisting. I, I don't send operators in uh, from the safety aspect. Um, precision alignment. Um, there, there's a lot of tools. I mean, if, if it's a basic belt, just like a V belt or something like that, you want to take a look at it, but that's easy to train the operators. But there's a lot of things, you know, couplings and soft foot and, and bearing alignments and things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I leave that to the, to the pros. Right. Um, almost all bearing installations. So if you look at, at how bearings fail, they're a kind of a bathtub failure curve. And there's a lot of bearings destroyed by installation. Put a brand new bearing in. It didn't last very long. Must not be the bearing. Yeah, it is. It wasn't installed right. <laughs> so I usually have skilled trades do that. Um, analysis of the condition-based monitoring. Uh, maybe instantaneous and alarming. We'll let the operators do that. But the analysis of trends and things that, that condition monitoring gives us. Mm-hmm. Um, and work requiring, uh, you know, advanced power tools. Mm-hmm. You know, most people can use like a, a drill motor or a sander. Okay, fine. But but, you know, lathes, mills, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, inner packs, you can do a lot of damage to the hydraulic, you know, inner packs and things like that. I mm-hmm. leave that to skill trade. Those are the kinds of things that we stick with skill trades. Okay. Well, let, let me ask a closing question with an area we haven't really talked about directly, which is planning and scheduling. Mm-hmm. Um, we did a survey, a sort of a post COVID survey, asking our readers had their maintenance practices changed during the pandemic? Had they snapped back to where they were before? That kind of question. And one of the questions we said was, was what is your greatest uh, need when it comes to like the human resource level? And they had, they had options they could choose from. Number one, even ahead of better interactions with the EHNS, number one was stronger planning and scheduling programs. Um, and, and, you know, we, we've thought about that. I'm not really sure exactly what it might mean to everyone, but what are your thoughts on the value that planning and scheduling function can bring to uh, programs like the ones you implemented? Oh, it's well, planning and scheduling. I can tell you that, and I was a plant manager for a short period of time. My planner would be the one to turn the lights out in the plant. Really? Yes, sir. If I have more than seven skilled trades people, I have a planner. All right. And people think I'm a nut, but I've proven time and time again. I've, and I've been involved in a number of turn, big turnarounds. Uh-huh. Kaiser, I was brought in Kaiser was in chapter 11 when I joined them. And I was part of the turnaround in, in, in Kaiser. And uh, uh, it was... Um, Olin Industries, uh, uh, global with global brass and copper, turn around 135 year old industry there and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, then then Kimberly Clark Europe, uh, when when they were still in the diaper business over there, uh, we had a plant there that went from the the highest cost producer to the lowest cost of producer, and we did it by planning and scheduling. <laughs> um, had had good skilled trades people, had good training, they just didn't execute well. So planning and scheduling, um, but again, that's an organizational decision. And, yeah. and a planner, a, a planner, people confuse planning and scheduling. Mm-hmm. Scheduling is when you execute the work. Planning is what you're going to do. And it's step by step. Mm-hmm. And so a planner's job, it, for anybody that works on cars, you know, you've got a motor's manual or Chilton's manual or, a, you know, Haynes manual to work on your car. A planner's job is to write that manual for your plant. That's what a planner's job is. So it's step by step. It doesn't tell you righty, tighty, lefty, loosey, but it has a sequential steps that they go through and the, the materials that they need so they can execute the job efficiently. And then you can take, you know, if you look at wrench time, it's how you measure uh, your skilled trades. It's the percent of time that they're actually plying their craft or trade. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a tremendous amount of waste and maintenance. World class, world class in wrench time is 56%, 57%. But when I go into plants, I see them at 7, 10, 15% when I measure it. Wow. So if you can get it from 15 to 30 and you're not even close to world class, you just double your maintenance workforce. Right. And, and right. so, so, so it, it is huge. And there's, there's all kinds of Terry Wireman wrote a whole series of books on, uh, and uh, Doc Palmer wrote the book on, on uh, maintenance planning and scheduling. Um, 
but don't confuse the two. And, and actually, I, I haven't found a place anymore. When I first got in consulting, I had hats made up. They were like ball caps that mm-hmm. had two bills. One side said planner and the other side said scheduler. Uh-huh. And when they would talk to you, they would the, the person would turn around that here. You're talking to this it could be the same person, but it's a different function. Right. And most right. people get the scheduling in and call it good. And planning is to improve the efficiency. So it minimizes the amount of time you're down, minimizes the, the, the waste. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you get good at planning and scheduling, you you can eliminate some of your your inventory and your your MRO stores, your parts stores. Mm-hmm. It has a huge impact on the on the business, and it's been documented you know time and time again. Uh, I I got a, a little uh, uh, business card from Doc one time, which uh, all I said was permission to make imperfect plans. Yep, no such thing's a perfect P- plan. PDCA, you know, make the plan, execute, and improve it if you can. But but see the the way that works is again when I said the whole organization has to buy into this, you give you give out an imperfect plan. It's the best we know right now, mm-hmm. and the person doing it, you don't expect them to do stupid. I mean, if it's stupid, don't do it. Yeah. But document why it's stupid and how it should be, and then give it back to the planner, and they can give out a, a less imperfect job plan next time. All right. You know where do you lose your time? And and I've got tools like maintenance mapping. We we watch and see. What happens? And when you're in the fire, you lose time and you don't realize how much time you're losing. Mm-hmm. I mean, because when I was a maintenance person, I was proud of pride myself on the amount of work I could do. And then when you watch yourself on videotape, you go, oh, that wasn't very good. <laughs> but you don't realize it at the time. So that's what planning and scheduling does is it helps to formalize that and improve right. it. Well, great. You know, I, David, we're, we're pretty close on time. So at this point, we'll leave uh, a further talk for hopefully a further date. But thank you today for being with us on this episode. I hope it helps other people. You know, that that's, you know, now that I'm a, now that I'm an old guy, you know, not much left to do except try to help the next generation out. And and I got all kinds of scars, you know, from learning this stuff the hard way and anything I can do to help the next generation, you know, I'm certainly willing to do. Well, thank, thank you for, for choosing our podcast to help today. I really do appreciate it. And it's good to talk with you again. All right. Good to see you. All right.